We're still slightly on the, on the early side, but uh, I'll make a slow start. And then uh, if anyone else comes up the steps, I can see it. It's lovely to be able to look out, as I've said before, but I always get a good view looking out to the Lich Gate and now the changing colors of the leaves hanging in front of it is quite nice. So I hope you're still comfy and cozy and uh, know to put warm coats on if, um, if it gets colder in the coming months. But it's wonderful to see you here and I will say a good morning. So you have your cue <laughs> and good morning and welcome to you if you are watching the live stream at home. Apologies, last week um, the AV team had a, an issue with YouTube and couldn't, couldn't get it to, to go, but uh, I think we're, we're live this morning, so there should be a live stream and then afterwards a video because that's what it does automatically for us very kindly. Uh, the people of YouTube, they make it possible to have a recording of the service afterwards too. Uh, a welcome to Derek Boyd, our organist this morning. He has swapped with Ian um, and we have already enjoyed some of us playing and we look forward to the rest of the service. Uh, we note that next week will be an all age service and uh, I'm hoping to plan for some tables and crafts at the front so if you uh, see any stray little ones then uh, bring them along and uh, we shall hopefully have a good good service that will be the conclusion of our creation time series I'd initially thought I would well I wasn't sure whether I would stop before I went away on holiday but on coming back I decided that it wasn't the story wasn't quite finished yet so we will conclude the sermon series if you like today but next week will be a prayer for the planet all age service to mark the start of COP26. Um, and then finally, after the service, we will uh, once again have coffee uh, and tea down below in the hall. So you're very warmly invited to come along to that. In Psalm 96, right, verse 12, it says, Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. The choir will now lead us into worship by singing the introit. Let us now all join in praise by singing 153, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Let us pray to God. Lord, our God and Creator, we praise you with all creation, the fields, the trees of the forests, the mountains, the plains. We lift our voices to you in praise and thankfulness, along with the song of the birds, the rush of the braes, and the roar of the seas. You are the endlessly creative, faithful one. You do not leave or abandon what your work has, what your hands have begun. You will not abandon creation to its fate, our self-inflicted fate. You work tirelessly to repair, reconcile, and recreate all of this, including us. We pray for your mercy and forgiveness as we confess we have been selfish and blinkered in our living. We confess we have not seen your glory and your grace in the living world around us and in the people we have met this week. We are full of our own thoughts and desires, not yours. And we have a limited vision of what the world could be, should be, we have not lived as Jesus has shown us, trusting in you for all things. Father, forgive us. Restore to us your Holy Spirit and make all things new. In the name and the strength of Jesus, our Lord, who is risen and alive forever. And we now pray as Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have two readings this morning, but we will sing a hymn in between, and Helen will come to read for us. The first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 11, reading from verse 1. The branch from Jesse. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might. The spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Amen. We'll sing hymn 237, Look Forward in Faith.
The second reading is taken from the book of Revelations, chapter 21, the first verse, and chapter 22, from verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the night of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. The angel said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. The Lord God, the Lord, the God who inspires the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Amen, and may God add his blessing to these readings from his most holy word. Thanks, Helen. Just a, a, well, a cue for, um, we're not there yet, <laughs> but for Naomi, there's a, a, a wee video that I'll ask for in a minute, and then later on there's also a picture, but I'll, I'll give you the cue. So we're not there yet. So the title for my sermon is Hope, A New Creation. During our holiday in the Netherlands last week, we visited a zoo with the children and my mom. It was Burger Zoo in Arnhem. Um, by the way, burger means citizen and not uh, something you can eat. Uh, I, Lois did get a very hilarious translation of a McDonald meal <laughs> on, her, uh, on her Google Translate app saying you could bite into a tasty Dutch citizen, <laughs> which <laughs> wasn't quite what we'd imagined eating on a bap. But uh, no, burger is citizen in this situation. Anyway, Burger Zoo in Arnhem is quite a, an old and famous zoo, but I'd never been there, nor had we taken the kids there. And so that's where we went. Now, this zoo is um, organized by natural habitats, and some of them really were quite spectacular. The first area we went into was the bush, a recreated tropical forest under a big dome, which looked a little bit like the Eden Project, except smaller, but still pretty big. It was humid and warm, and just stepping into it, you felt in a different place. It was full of all sorts of trees in different scents, and we could hear exotic birds cawing somewhere up in the dome, but we, it was really rather hard to actually spot them in the thick foliage, and apparently there was also other um, mammals that, again, we struggled to see them, which is kind of the drawback of the concept, even though it made it more authentically a jungle experience. So that was the bush. Um, and then we went through to the ocean's biotope, which was a most amazing aquarium with real living coral and thousands of tropical fish. And I've seen aquaria before, but it just was really good and quite spectacular. Apparently, it's the largest living coral reef in Europe, and it requires constant management of all the, you know, the light and the nutrients that are in the water. I find there's something quite mesmerizing about watching fish, especially the ones with the most mind-blowing patterns and colors. And undoubtedly, these have you know, evolved for reasons and purpose, some evolutionary benefit, but just beholding the riotous display of color and shape makes me wonder about the creativity of God. 
The very, very thick glass meant we could stand inches away from these beautiful creatures. The third area we came to was called the mangrove, and I believe it's quite unique to Burger Zoo. A mangrove is a sort of wetland forest that grows on the boundary of land and sea in tropical climates. The mangrove trees have long stilts that can stand the tides and the salt water. And among these roots, um, fish can lay eggs and young fish can find protection. Burgers, who have been involved in protecting an actual mangrove and adjacent rainforest in Belize for over 30 years. But in the zoo, as we stepped into this other dome, there were fabulous tropical butterflies flitting around our heads and then resting on the flowering bushes. There were funny crabs in the brackish mud flats that had been recreated. And most exciting of all, there were two manatees ruminating around in the shallow water. Now, in Dutch, manatees are fairly prosaically called sea cows. They graze on um, sea grasses, weeds, and algae. However, speaking slightly more to the imagination in the wild, they may have been the creatures that sailors mistook for mermaids on the rocks with their voluptuous bodies and flipper tail. Call it what you like, but I'd never seen a manatee up close before, and it was quite fascinating. I have a short video that gives you an impression of the mangrove area in this zoo. Um, I won't continue my tour around the zoo as it wouldn't really constitute a sermon. Um, however, these three habitats were really the most out of the ordinary and I guess the most unlike any other zoo I'd been to. I'm always slightly conflicted about zoos because I'm aware that keeping animals in captivity for our entertainment isn't really the most animal-loving thing to do. And whilst zoos have improved greatly, over the past century or so, there is still a sense that being in the wild might be better or a richer life for some of these animals. And you could argue that with our current abilities to make the most, uh, of, the most uh, of the amazing nature documentaries, zoos aren't really necessary anymore to educate us about animals. And yet there is something quite irreplaceable about being face to face with these real living, breathing, amazingly different animals. An animal that you can see, smell, hear, and sometimes even touch. Another living being with its own self, alive, glorious, and created. To me, that day in the zoo filled me with praise and wonder. Wonder at the marvel of creation and praise for the creator. The two passages that we've read from Isaiah and Revelation, to me, fill me with longing and hope of that kind of a up-closeness with the more wonderful and weird aspects of nature being able to come close and touch without harm. These passages fill me with longing and hope for a different world, or maybe one that's both different and still the same, amazingly transformed and yet recognizably marvelous. Crazy, wonderful artwork of the same creator that imagined it all. Halted breath exciting closeness and aliveness. The lion will lay down with the lamb. The child reaches out to touch naturally and curiously, and it is quite safe. 
up close, closer than ever before, no harm will come of it. A world full of wonder, see and touch. A river of life, splash and drink. A tree full of fruit, take and eat. I know both these passages are prophecy and poetry, impossible and fantastical as far as we can tell. A vegetarian lion would surely not still be recognizable as a lion. A cow and a bear grazing together, well, maybe that's one for the fairy tales. Maybe you are inclined towards the rational and analytical like me, and you want to ask, well, how is this possible? And when is this ever going to be? And where is the evidence? And I'm not saying these aren't valid questions, and I do think and I want to believe that these visions will have some actual real-life realization at some point with actual animals and actual grass and actual children, not spiritual holograms. But it is also important when we read these passages to remember that these are visions. They are prophetic and poetic visions given to Isaiah and to John by God. Both the book of Isaiah and of Revelations are full of all sorts of visions, some really quite horrific and dreadful others comforting and hope-giving. These visions have their power not as rational or orderly description of what's going to happen tomorrow, but as vivid pictures, vistas of alternative realities. These visions were given to people in very difficult circumstances during tumultuous and frightening times. Life was frightening and disorientating for the people receiving these visions. They had little control over what was happening, things spinning out of control. For Isaiah, he was preaching at the time of the Babylonian exile. And John of Patmos was writing to small Christian churches suffering from Roman persecution. Things were happening all around them and they had very little say, no control to stop it. And maybe we can relate to that when we look at the world and we look at the climate crisis and we feel similarly small and insignificant. And yet here, says God, don't be afraid. Look at this, this vision. This is also true. One day, They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. And this, this is also true, a new heaven and a new earth. Never again will anything be cursed. Never again will there be any night. Life, abundance, healing and light. Hold on to this when you are surrounded by fear and darkness. Proverbs 29 verse 18 says in the King James Version, without vision, the people perish. Without vision, the people perish. These poetic visions which we have heard, maybe they don't make too much sense to us. Maybe we cannot translate them into a 10-year actionable climate plan to avert Uh, rising temperatures. But these poetic visions do give us a much needed vision, a vision of hope, creation renewed and restored, a direction of travel. If I could have the painting, please. Now, it's quite dark, and I'm also where it's still even blown up, probably a little bit small. But I came across this painting Uh, on a blog post online. It was painted by an African-American artist, Horace Pippin, who lived from 1888 to 1946, and he was self-taught. 
It depicts the peaceable kingdom of Isaiah 11 with lions and wolves and leopards and lambs, children playing near adders and a shepherd, a black shepherd in the middle. The black shepherd in the center is Jesus. It may seem an innocent or naive painting, but if you look closely, you can see in the forest shadows of violence. And that's probably pretty much impossible to see like this, uh, but I can share the picture uh, later if you want via the email. There's a lynched man left uh, hanging off a tree. There are planes dropping bombs above a graveyard of crosses in the center, and two armed soldiers and a tank on the right. It is not a naive painting, but it chooses to put a spotlight on a different kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, as Isaiah portrayed it. A commentator writes about the painting, rather than turning a blind eye to the painful realities of a sad and violent world, Pippin presents a vision of mankind moving out of the shadows and into the brilliant brilliant light of a peaceful clearing. This peaceable kingdom can only come about when people turn to Christ, the one, as Isaiah puts it, on who God's spirit rests and who leads with wisdom and understanding, with compassion and justice. For us, not immune to the climate anxiety on the one hand, or selfish indifference at the other. We need these visions of God's new creation. We need this prophetic vision to give hope and to direct our actions. Over the past six, seven weeks, we've learned that God cares for creation. We've learned that humans are not the center of it, God is. And we've learned that God reconciles all things, reconciles all of creation to himself through Christ on the cross. And finally, these visions of Isaiah and of John remind us that God is working to recreate all things. His kingdom will be complete. His will will be done on earth as it is already in heaven. And it will include all the marvelous, wonderful living beings that we share our precious planet with. When we despair and feel helpless and powerless in the face of climate change and ecological destruction, it is these visions that we can lean into, that we can live towards. However small and apparently futile, our own individual actions and our energies, they go towards God's glorious new creation. Even if our actions just flicker like fireflies in the night, they light the way to the kingdom of light. God will make it so. He's making all things new. Our creator is the faithful one. Amen. We're going to sing, View the Present Through the Promise, hymn 479.
Let us pray. Creative, faithful God, Christ, just and wise ruler, spirit, stirrer-upper and hope-giver, we give thanks for the visions of hope of your kingdom come, O creation renewed and restored, one with heaven. We wonder and marvel at these visions. They seem too good to be true, and yet we need them to keep going. Without vision, we, your people, perish. We need to know that our labor is not in vain, that you are making all things new. Help us to keep living into this vision of your peaceable kingdom, of justice, of beauty, of flourishing. We pray for the preparations for COP26, for governments and civil servants preparing and negotiating, for folk traveling from all parts of the planet, for those who are hopeful and those who are cynical, for those whose lives depend on change, and for those whose livelihoods might change or be lost because of it. We pray for the wisdom and justice of Christ. On him rests your spirit, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might. You will not judge by what you see with your eyes or decide by what you hear with your ears, but with righteousness you will judge the needy and give decision with justice for the poor of the earth. May we be like you, Christ, filled with your Spirit. May we be like you, wise in understanding and fear only God. We give thanks for the earth's abundance. May all share in it equally and treasure it for future generations. We pray for those working to better understand and protect natural habitats and the animals living in it. We pray for those who look after farm animals and do work in the bio-industry. May they be as wise and caring as you are. We pray for us all that we consider what we contribute to today's ecological problems and how we can change our ways. God, there are a million things to pray for, yet even the sparrows are in your care and you number the hairs on our head. So we pray in the silence for ourselves, for others, for those struggling with life or with death. We thank you that you hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is a psalm. It's hymn 37. God is our refuge, God our strength. And the image of the river coming from the city here is also found. Hymn 37. <laughs>
this world. Keep your eyes open to the vision of this new creation and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore.